Coming up on This Week in Radio Tech, we're talking to Lee Melton. Now, Lee's uh, DJ story is pretty interesting. He started at KFI, and his career went downhill from there. <laughs> Chris Tarr joins us with some great stories as well. We're just having a good time talking about being a DJ and a little bit of engineering uh, mixed in for good measure. Uh, it's coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio, Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio, audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, worry-free transmission you can count on with outstanding control, reliability, efficiencies, and Nautel's unmatched 24-7 customer support online at Nautel.com. And by Max Connect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from uh, the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower. You know, this this room right here feeds about five different towers. So there's five light bulbs. Hi, I'm Kirk Harnack. Delighted to be with you. And thanks for tuning in. We're going to have a very fun show today. It'll be less about technical stuff and more about uh, the things we love about radio. Uh, it's a, it, Our guest is amazing. Chris Tarr is here as the co-host. And he's got stories to tell as well, and I might have a, something fun to tell as well. Uh, but our show, This Week in Radio Tech, is brought to you by some amazing sponsors, including Nautel and uh, Max Connect and Angry Audio and Broadcasters General Store and Broadcast Bionics. So when you get a chance, please uh, you know, patronize these, these sponsors. Check them out. Check out their websites. We'll tell you about them as the, uh, as the show goes on. So where am I? I'm at my radio station in Cleveland, Mississippi. Uh, Larry Fuss and I have a few radio stations here, and we are, well, I was at the um, Mississippi Broadcasters uh, Association at their convention in Biloxi, Mississippi, just yesterday. Uh, we, there was an SBE NS workshop there, and uh, I was uh, honored to speak there along with Jeff Welton and Mike Pappas, and uh, uh, Wayne Piscina was there as well. Uh, we uh, hopefully educated a few people on some engineering things and had some fun uh, in, in the meantime. So I uh, thought I'd make a stop here at Cleveland, Mississippi, fix a few computers, replace uh, an STL transmitter, and uh, replace some batteries in, in an old UPS. Just about everything is done, so we'll be moving on from here. That's enough about me, though. Uh, Chris Tarr is here. Chris Tarr, welcome in. Good to see you from McQuanago. Hello there. I'm, I'm trying to recover. I am so sore. Uh, we did this week, we did our, our big installation of the Valcom antenna on my AM in Reedsburg, Wisconsin. We had a tower fall about a year and a half ago, and I've been running on an STA with a long wire antenna. Finally got the Valcom antenna, which is one of those new style, top loaded, it's about 70 feet tall. It's got a big sphere thing on the top. And I uh, got that, finally oh, got it in the air uh, last week. And then yesterday I got it all uh, connected and commissioned and put on the air. So i uh, pleasantly, People have been asking because it is it is fairly fairly blah, 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 fairly new, uh, not many of them out there. So people have been asking, you know, how it's uh, how it's been going. I can say from experience now, a good ground system helps. I mean, this thing performs about as well as the original tower, but we also have a really good ground system. Uh, wow. It's for fourteen hundred kilohertz and up because of the height, uh, and I highly recommend they sell an optional tuning unit. Uh, now, we already had one, but this one comes pre-tuned. So basically, you connect it to the tower. The other end is 50 ohms J0. Put that under your transmitter. And I had it on the air in, I don't know, 20 minutes. It was pretty pretty impressive. Wow. Hey, uh, not for this show, but another show, i got to ask you about that spherical thingy at, at the top of the Valcom. <laughs> i got to believe yeah. this. You, you, you know how all the jets these days have those winglets at the end? It's got to yep. be like that, but for radio. That's, that's what exactly. Like. Yep. That sounds about right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, uh, Chris, uh, joining us today is a very interesting guest. And I met this guy on Facebook and then I found out that like, he's, he's like radio famous. And so let's bring him in now. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, his real name is Lee Melton, but he's got a number of aliases because there are sheriff's departments across the country, uh, that, uh, that have looked for him over his career. Lee Melton, welcome in. It's great to see you. 
Well, thank you, my friend. And by the way, there's three jails that won't really want me back in, but we'll talk later. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, Lee, when, when you and I first started talking, um, you told me that your career started at the age of 17 at KFI. I guess that's Los Angeles and uh, went downhill from there. Uh, we, we don't, we'll get the whole story as we go through, but give us a little elevator talk about uh, who is Lee Melton. Actually, I'm just a guy that loves radio. I was 17, went to KFI with a friend, and uh, he had to go to the bathroom, and the old man, which now is probably younger than me, walked in and said, hey, kid, you want a job? Sat me down at the uh, board and said, just say KFI Los Angeles. Once an hour, I was 59 minutes and probably 52 seconds and nailed it for uh, three, four weeks. And then it went to Roseburg, Oregon. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Wow. And yeah. and we're, we're going to have some stories to tell, including there's a title that you have carried with pride uh, in your career. And that I, I, I want to say it was King of Trade. Is that is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Actually, traded a funeral once for one of my partners in radio, fifty thousand bucks, and I traded my last station close to a million dollars worth of <laughs> doors, equipment, station vehicles, and uh, in a permit for day beyond a year. And my engineer, I put him up in the the Hilton for two years. Yeah, two years cost me probably eighty thousand bucks in hotel trade. Yeah, I'm the king of trade. Anybody else you know who traded a funeral? Talk to me. Chris, did I tell you this was going to be a fun show? Are you looking forward to the hour ahead? Yes, sir, absolutely did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, folks, we've given you a little taste of Lee Melton. He'll be uh, coming up. We'll be telling stories. And uh, and I want to hear, uh, you know, about what Lee remembers about his control rooms from the 19, uh, whenever he started, late 60s into the 70s, what the what the control rooms looked like and the equipment that he dealt with. Uh, plus, we're going to hear radio stories, too. And I, I can't wait. Chris Tarr has got a couple things to add, and maybe I'll have a story to add as well. Uh, but, you know, big city radio is a little different than, than what I grew up with, you know, in, in central Kentucky in small towns. Hey, our show this week in Radio Tech, right off the bat, is brought to you by Nautel. And Nautel has their, uh, their digital, their HD radio digital test drive. That's what they are, are wanting you to know about. And they're offering um, this test drive as a way for broadcasters, uh, primarily in, in the U.S., but it's good for Canada, too, and uh, other countries where, uh, where HD radio is, uh, is popular or is the standard. Uh, the idea here is to break down the barriers that have been keeping stations from trying HD radio. Um, HD radio has the potential to unlock new listeners for you let you put out some new formats, maybe other languages, maybe a music format that's missing in your market. Maybe is there, maybe your competitor has a real popular format that you want to try to take a bite out of. I mean, you can do that. Uh, plus, HD Radio gives you things like a beautiful title and artist, but also album artwork can easily be put on HD Radio, plus your station logo. And there's even new possibilities with the new EAS uh, system that's been developed by Digital Alert Systems, Nautel, and by Telos Alliance called EAS at the Edge. Check this thing out. So for a minimal cost, uh, you can turn on HD radio transmission on your station, test new revenue uh, opportunities. Uh, you can counter competing alternate media, you know, all the other things that are on the dashboard now. It makes you really stand out. Uh, what you need to get started, you lease or you purchase a Nautel GV2 transmitter, or you upgrade your existing GV transmitter to a GV2. And that's a worthwhile upgrade in and of itself. Then you also need an Xperi main station or equivalent license and a signed trial agreement with Nautel. And then you need some content, you know, produce uh, another channel or two of interesting programming. And uh, we're, hey, we're doing that in Oxford, Mississippi, just up the road from here. Uh, we're doing oldies on uh, an HD2 and a light urban AC on an HD3. Uh, plus we've got, uh, you know, alt rock on the FM and the HD1. We put this on a year ago without the benefit of this test drive. You can do it and save a ton of money uh, by contacting your Nautel representative. Thanks a lot, Nautel, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. All right, we're here with uh, Lee Melton and Chris Tarr is along too. Lee, I, I want to hear more about you getting started at KFI. Can you tell us what you remember about the control room when you walked in to, to kind of start doing your announcing? 
my God. We had the old, I think, gates for it. The old dials, the old pots. Yeah. I wasn't there that, 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 that long. I was young. Didn't know my butt from a hole in the ground. I say yes, but we can't say yes, right? Say. <laughs> and it was a it was a crazy time. I was young, making more money than I had ever made in my life, and like for three four weeks, and then I fell in love with the craft of radio. And by the way, I did stutter as a child, so I had to overcome that uh, little impedance, as they say, yep. and got into radio. Weird. Would would you say that when you started there doing the top of the hour and just that, do you feel like you had a a, a strong radio voice then at that tender age of seventeen? I've never had a great radio voice. I have the energy to do top forty. If I uh, did a little sit at KFRC, I met Bill Lee and oh, yeah. Broadway Bill Lee, and it done on me. I'll never be that good, but uh, I always had the energy. The energy. To give you what you want. Now, uh, Chris Tar, you've heard you know, plenty of top 40 DJs. And when I was in high school, so I was probably actually 15, just turning 16, I was working at WEKY in Richmond, Kentucky. And the, the station manager, a guy named Ted Johnson, he's still around, owns some stations in Nashville now. Ted brought uh, an announcer in, I forget his name. I want to say his last name may have been Bell, but he came in. And I didn't think he had a good voice at all, but oh my goodness, did he have the energy and just made you want to listen through and, and stay tuned for the next song. I mean, he was so excited about the song he just played and the next song that it really, it just came out of your radio speakers, his excitement. Chris, you guys experienced that uh, up where you live? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, I got, I got started really early. I mean, my first, uh, almost, I don't know, I was probably 19 when I got my first big top 40 job. And that was at a pretty influential top 40 station uh, in Wisconsin, 100 kilowatt, uh, big FM out of Green Bay. And then that actually, by before I was 21, was in Milwaukee at a major market there. So, um, you know, I ran into a lot of people. And I, I remember as a program director, I've always said, you know, I have no problem hiring somebody who may not have the best radio voice if they've got an amazing personality. And history shows, I mean, some of the biggest personalities in the country really don't have a typical radio voice, but they're just very, very talented people. I'd rather, I'd rather hear those people all day long over somebody with a great voice. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I, I, I would agree with that. Lee, um, you mentioned some of the people that you've worked with. Broadway Bill Lee. Now, I never knew he was on the West Coast. Uh, I always knew him as a New York guy, but I've only known him about eight or nine years now. Uh, uh, tell me about either Broadway Bill Lee or anybody else really influential for you. Actually, uh, uh, I met Bill back in 82, 83. Did a little weekend stint at uh, KFRC. He was so impressive, six to midnight. My God, he kicked my butt. He kicked everyone's ass. Sorry, can't say that word. But I was so impressed by the way that he could just talk. The energy is there. And when you see him in a normal interview, he doesn't talk that way. He's like normal, like us. <laughs> okay, Did, you know he kind of does that that rhyming thing as he talks into a song intro. At least what I've heard uh, in in you know from yeah. his, his New York work. Did he do that then? Did he did he rhyme up through the song intro? No, actually, he would rhyme the uh, liners for the spots. It would be bizarre. He would like talk about the weather, the next concert coming up, but the liner for the uh, appliance store he'd tie in and rhyme it. I never, I could never do that. And that's when I got into the business side of radio. Well, don't, don't go far. We'll let it out of the jar because our next up, we got Chris Tarr. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the kind that's of thing nice. he would yeah, do. No, I, I, uh, I've been a big follower of Billy for years and years and years. And, you know, every station he's been at, he's done that. And he, he's just such a talented guy with a, a brain that runs 100 miles an hour and a mouth that runs just about as fast and uh, just a, an amazing guy and there's a you know there's a there's a guy who for example you know i, I don't know that he's he's super topical but he is in his own way with the with the rhyming and 
that's just one of those things that is just such a he could have any voice in the world, but that that content that he does with the rhyming is so cool. I, I can't do it. I couldn't even do it if I tried. Even though I like wrote it out, I couldn't do it. I'm, Chris, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come back to Chris in, in a minute uh, about building studios for talent that has very particular needs or desires. But but uh, um, uh, Lee, uh, what if I may ask you? Think about what's the what's the nicest, most amazing control room you've ever worked in, and what made it so good for you. Probably the one I built in Beaumont, Texas. I actually did a stand-up operation for my producer and the the talk talk room, and I built the uh, console too high, so I had to build a step up. But I had the <laughs> best board, the best. Yeah, I know. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not good at math, sorry. But uh, no, I'm probably more, more proud of that than anything else in Little Beaumont, Texas. Well, now I would have thought that the nicest one would have been in a, in a big market, but uh, it's something that you designed. Now, tell me, what, what led you to build the stand-up so it was too high that you had to go step up on a board to get up even higher? I, 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 how'd that mistake get made? Or was it a mistake? Uh -huh. Yeah, it was a big mistake. I was uh, actually planning out my little station, and I had the all the trade that I did, and I actually brought in my contractor that I traded with, and had him build this thing to my height. Turns out the kids are not my my height; they're smaller, so they couldn't actually see the talk show host. Yeah, it's kind of embarrassing, but hey, we got through it. All right. Well. Chris, to you, um, talk to me about, have, have you had to build a studio to suit the likes of somebody in particular? Well, I've got, I've kind of got two stories to go along with that. One of them uh, is a little more funny talking about working with talent. And I, I will, the, the station will remain nameless just because I don't have anybody figuring out who this was. But I was doing a, an automation installation and the morning show had their own studio with their own automation system or whatever to, to play on the air and I'm working with the local engineer and I'm, I, I'm putting the new equipment in the new automation stuff into his studio. And the engineer said, well, you can't do that. So well, what do you mean? Well, the morning guy wants things his own way. I mean, you just can't be putting stuff in there. And I said, well, you know, we got to get this done. So, you know, I put the stuff in there. I get there the next morning, stuff sitting outside in the hallway. And I said, okay. So I took the stuff and I put it back in the studio again, in this morning guy's studio. Next morning, we're getting ready to commission things. It's out of the hallway again. So finally, I tracked this guy down. And I said, listen, you know, I, I, I get it. You don't like it. That's fine. But I'll tell you what, I, you know, it's going to tomorrow, we're going to go on the air whether you like it or not. And if that stuff isn't in there, you're not going to be on the air. <laughs> that's, that's what's going to be playing back. So, I, you know, if you don't want it, that's fine. I'm done playing. but you know, you're, you're going to, they're going to hit the switch tomorrow morning and there's nothing going to happen because you're not going to have an automation system. So that pretty well fixed that problem. He didn't uh, say another word to me after that, but uh, I, I think, you know, it's it, the best, one of the better studios I built was the radio Milwaukee studio. And I got a lot of input on the announcers there. That was long after I'd been on the air and that, I think that helps the fact that I was on the air. I kind of know, you know, what, what works and what doesn't work. But I, I sat down with each one of them and said, okay, write out your, your list of things that you would love to see in this studio. And, you know, we'll do the ones that we can do. And, uh, you know, we, it was an interesting, we ended up with uh, a little performance stage in the studio, uh, just a, like a, like a riser kind of thing. Um, we had a, we actually put a pneumatic lift on the countertop so you could sit or stand because Half the people wanted to sit, half the people wanted to stand. So hit this button and it pushes the desktop up. So, you know, a lot of really cool feedback there. And it was 100% based on on feedback because I'd rather, I, you know, I come from the school of, I would rather build a studio at, that works for them rather to, than having them try to work with the studio. Uh, you know, our job is to make content creation for these people super easy and then get out of the way. So I had no problem admitting that I should not be the one to, de to design the studio. You know, tell me what you want. We'll go through this plan. 
and we'll make it happen. And that studio turned out amazing. I mean, people loved be you know working in there because it was so. I mean, even just simple things like you know USB jacks in the countertop to plug in their phones or their iPads or whatever, um, you know stuff like that that just I wouldn't have thought of on my own. But these people, you know, these the, the people on the air, these are things that you know I had been on the air since you know before iPhone so I never would have guessed a USB port but they're like oh yeah we'd love to have a USB port you know maybe even a a a jack for our phone to plug into for audio and stuff great you know so I set all that up and and uh, it's it's been it worked out really well for them Lee uh you 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 said your favorite uh control room was the one that, that you built uh what are some features that you've you've really liked like maybe carts that would cue each other, you know, that would one that would end, it would start the next one, or uh, maybe three turntables, or, you know, what, what are some things that you've liked and enjoyed in a studio? Man, that's a great question. Uh, uh, I like the fact that we get the signal from the station to the towers. <laughs> well, that's crazy. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a crazy time, but uh, no, I had a, a morning guy that I loved to death. A handful, kind of like herding cats, so talented, but he couldn't keep his things together on the air. I mean, great technical work, but it was such an interesting time in my life that uh, I know you got me thinking about so so many things. Sorry. <laughs> um. Now, have you always had, uh, in your early days, did you always have cart machines or did you have a technology that preceded cart decks? Oh, no, I love cart decks. I love cart machines. My God, I hate computers. I hate all this crap that they're doing. Give me a cart machine, three two tables, some disc, which we call records now, kids. And I'm in heaven. All the computer stuff with the the programs. Uh, you know, I used to work for uh, Clear Channel. When they started coming out with all of the uh, computer crap and then firing all the DJs, it's like, wow, uh, let's try to make the radio a little more friendly to the folks working and to the audience. But hey. Chris, um, are, are you old enough to, to, uh, to have cart machines that maybe didn't fire each other sequentially and then maybe like i did i was probably i don't know uh 18 19 years old maybe 20 and i was reading the manual that the cart machine could you could do like a a secondary tone uh, or a terse tone and you could make it fire the next one and so within a week i had all that wired up with switches uh, that i drilled holes in the board (laughs) to you know so you could enable or disable you know, the cart machines fired and I could actually get them and walk away while I had to go through and record all the carts, you know, had to add sec tones on all the carts. Did, did you ever come across that, Chris? Are, are you that old? Well, yeah, I played records for gosh sakes. Um, yeah, no, I, I ran into, you know, I had triple deckers that just you fired manually. And then when I got my first big market gig, they had a sequencer and I couldn't believe it. I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing except that all we sequenced was spots. We couldn't sequence music or jingles because they wanted us to manually do those segues on our own and not have it sequenced. But it was great to, you know, have a stop set at a big market. They were, you know, a couple minutes long for sure. Pop a bunch of the the carts in. I think this had like six or nine decks and you could load everything up, start the first spot, walk away, go do what you're going to do and come back. So, but yeah, that was, that was like, amazing when i ran into that i'm like wow you can do that this is great technology is awesome <laughs> oh my god hey That's uh cool. uh bill uh, we're gonna do a spot break here bill but when we come back bill uh, i'm sorry lee lee uh you and i think of bill lee aren't you bill lee on my mind uh lee when we come back bef- earlier today you and i talked about uh dealing with uh celebrities uh, including bands or other or actors and so forth uh, at big city stations. And I, I want to hear a story or two about that when we uh, when we come back and whatever else you might have to talk about. This week in Radio Tech, I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tarr, my co-host, and Lee Melton is our guest. And uh, Lee started at KFI and went downhill from there. That's what, that's what he tells everybody. Uh, but he's been quite a talent and uh, and still does uh, 
does acting and, and voice work today. Um, our show is brought to you in part by Broadcast Bionics. And Broadcast Bionics, they, these guys make amazing software and some hardware solutions that make your broadcasting better. You do the same things you're doing now, but you get to capture it in different ways and republish it in social media uh, or for contesting or, or whatever. But check this out, the Bionic Studio from Broadcast Bionics. Welcome to the Bionic Studio. The Bionic Studio brings all audience interaction to the fingertips of a production team in radio, TV, and podcast. Our workflow-led system is working 24-7 around the world for small broadcasters and national and international networks. Our telephony module, Bionic Talk Show, allows cost-effective centralization, remote operation, scalability, and resilience across an entire network of stations, but at the same time is used in single studio self-op environments. Social media curation and activity is now considered a broadcast critical part of programming. Bionic Social means the studio isn't overwhelmed with a wall of interaction from an ever-growing number of social platforms. We combine SMS, MMS and email together with a speech-to-text service for listeners using smart speakers. We enable studio teams to curate, filter and display all platforms in one place and post text, images and video content to multiple platforms in one operation. Effortless collection of video content with Bionic Director has helped position some of the world's most successful stations as leaders in viral content, generating appointments to listen and free marketing via retweets and shares. Bionic Contest enables end-to-end -end tracking of on-air competitions, live reads and prizes. These could be on-air contests, automated SMS entry or online. Anywhere and Skype TX for Radio brings high quality audio and video contribution into the studio with ease. No need for dedicated PCs to run different applications. Everything is controlled within the Bionic Studio UI and incoming connections are visible to users along with all other platforms. Our codec integration enables connection, algorithm configuration and directory to a wide range of IP and ISDN codecs. The Bionic Studio, a unique suite of products designed to enable your talent to work smarter. Broadcast Bionics, so cool, including Virtual Rack. It's just amazing. Sometimes we talk about Virtual Rack, but you want to check out all the Broadcast Bionics stuff. Their website is bionic.co.uk or bionics.co.uk. Check them out. Love these guys. Thanks a lot, Broadcast Bionics sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. And by the way, as an engineer, you'll be a hero for recommending and implementing uh, some of their stuff to make your stations have a tighter connection with your listeners. Hey, it's Kirk Harnack along with uh, Chris Tarr and Lee Melton is our guest. Lee's a disc jockey, started at the tender age of 17, as many of us did around that age. And, uh, and Lee's been in all kinds of different markets and he's here giving us some stories uh, Lee, we've talked a bit about studios. If any more st studios come to mind, feel welcome to interject that. But we were uh, chatting about um, you know, uh, celebrities coming into your radio station. Uh, and and uh, I've got a story I might tell. I may have told it before. But uh, Lee, what's a, a really memorable time about a, a, you know, celebrities coming into your station? How'd you handle that? Uh, in the big cities, I'm sure that happens fairly frequently. Well, actually, uh, when I was in uh Outside of Bakersfield, we're having one of the first Christian rock stations in California. And I met everyone from Denny Corral, Petra, and Striper. I know you have a story. And I opened, opened for them in Bakersfield, California. <laughs> and I actually was voted the number one Christian DJ in 85. And I turned it down because I didn't think that DJs and Christian music should be awarded like that. And I couldn't afford the airfare, so I didn't go and get my <laughs> freaking award. <laughs> wow. Oh, All right. And, All right. And I, you, you had a couple you know, other I, stories that you, that you mentioned. Yeah. No, actually, uh, I have a technical story. I was given a hundred, or betted a hundred bucks to climb a tower, 225 feet, to change the light uh, on the top of the tower. I did it. I had no clue the towers. Sway at the top. I was scared as a little girl at the top. <laughs> it was crazy. Oh, no. I didn't know. Well, I, got, I got my hundred bucks. 
and I went back on the air that same day. Yeah. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, yeah. used a hundred bucks to buy a new pair of underwear, but uh, yeah, yeah. Know, there you go. <laughs> oh yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> I might, I might have gone home and crawled up in the fetal position and just taken a nap. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I was, I was the hero, hero of California. I climbed the tower with no safety. Changed the light bulb, oh. got my 100 bucks, and said, no way in hell I'll ever do that again. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Chris, have you done any tower climbing, Chris Tarr? You've seen me in person. Do I look like I've ever climbed a tower? Dude, what? I couldn't climb the first three oh, feet. No, oh, oh, come on. I've never climbed a tower. I have people that do that. You, you, you got muscle under that bulk, dude. I know you do. <laughs> no, I've got more bulk under that bulk. So forget oh, about it. <laughs> okay, I'll forget about it. I've, I climbed a 400-foot tower. It was, In fact, it was a Christian AM station in Memphis. And I did have, I had climbing gear. I had a ski rope to keep me safe. Oh, well, at least you're safe. <laughs> About four feet of ski rope, that in my belt. And um, I, I changed out the, you know, the, the, the big 620 watt incandescent lamps at the top of the tower. I, mm. I think we, I think we turned off the 50 kilowatt transmitter while I was doing that. I think. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Knowing yeah. you now, it, there may, that damage may have already been done, I think. Well, yeah, um, Lee. Uh, what you had now? You had a story about some actor from the Love Boat showing up. What? What was that about? Uh, Fred Gandy, the guy that played a Gopher, showed up to my station in Beaumont, Texas. Kind of a strange guy, kind of stuck up, kind of a snot, an ass. But hey, I got a picture with him, signed autograph, so I'm okay. Okay. Well, that, now, Chris, in Milwaukee, that's that's no small market, right? Uh, you you right. must have had some celeb run-ins or rock star run-ins. Well, there's there's two that I want to talk about. One was actually at the station. The other was was supposed to be and turned out entirely different. So uh, the first one was actually, well, probably not more than a couple of years ago uh, when I was still at Intercom. And I was in the, um, I don't remember, like the Jock Lounge or something. And somebody was Weird Al had come in to be on the air oh. and they were showing him around. <laughs> and, you know, the person giving the tour, you know, I was the engineer, so I'm always the afterthought, you know, and and they're walking by and and they walk past the door and they went, Oh, that's Chris, he's our engineer. And they started to walk away. And Al went, Wait, wait, those are my favorite people. And he comes running in and he throws my armor, his <laughs> his armor on me and goes, Take my picture, take my picture. So I have a picture of Weird Al yeah. with his arm around me. He's like, these guys are the best. They're my favorite people at the radio station. I thought that was awesome. I was like, ha, showed you. Take him right by the door. Uh, so that was one. And then the other one, this one was my favorite. 1990, I want to say 1990, 1989, something like that. I couldn't, I wasn't old enough to drink. I was 18 or 19. And uh, I was in LA for this big multi-day radio press event and so you know we're sitting there hanging out and it turns out that week we were supposed to interview paul mccartney over the phone he had just released the album tripping the live fantastic so we were supposed to interview him on the, on the morning show and we were but we were in la so we talked to the record rep and said hey do you think we could just come by capitol records and interview him in person and he said well <laughs> you know i don't know i don't know and he called back and said no talk to paul he said great we're like, what? <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to interview Paul McCartney. Oh my God. So, you know, I quick ran and I did some research and, you know, cause I, I back then there's no internet or anything. So I walk in, we walk into the Capitol records building and we're sitting in uh, the reps office. We see the, the doors open for the elevator, this whole like big posse walks out. And I'm thinking that's gotta be him. No, that was MC Hammer with his crew. So, <laughs> okay. So, we're, you know, we're just sitting there. And, and by the way, Paul McCartney, as you might know, is, is vegan. And so there was no meat in the building. I, I had no idea at the time. I said, here, would you like a, a sub, you know, a little sub sandwich for lunch? I'm like, great. Took a bite into his office. It was like avocado. And I was like, ah, 
So just something to know if you're ever going to meet Paul McCartney. Uh, so we're sitting there. He just walks in. You know, no, no crowd, no entourage or anything. He just walks in and introduces himself. And I'm just like, you're, you're, you're Paul McCartney. So we sat down. Just the, I mean, the nicest guy. He couldn't have been nicer. And one of the things I found in my research was that he he mentioned once that he and John, whenever they needed money, they would write a song. And he said, well, you know, if we if I wanted to put a swimming pool in the backyard, I'd write a song and I'd take that money and we call it, you know, writing a swimming pool. So I, in my interview, I said, so, Paul, have you ever, you know, have you had to write, write any swimming pools lately? And he started laughing. He's like, I almost forgot saying that. He's like, that is so hilarious. He's like, no, haven't had to write any of those lately. And, uh, you know, just had a great time. And and the the only downside of the story was that, you know, we had a, a copy copies of his CD. And I said, hey, you know, would you mind autographing this? And he said, yes, but because of, you know, resales and stuff, I will only autograph it to a certain person. Well, what do I do? I'm an idiot. My fiance at the time, Wendy, was a big fan, so I had him autograph it to her. And six months later, we broke up. And I'm just like, why did I? That was the dumbest thing in the world. What was I doing? So anyway, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the Paul McCartney story. All I have is the memories, but they're very fond. He was just a... Couldn't have been nicer. It was just so great. <laughs> what a great story. That's awesome. Uh, that is awesome. Lee, and Lee, I think, uh, where, did you say, did uh, you have an MC Hammer story or something else? Go ahead. Yeah, go I ahead. do. I, I, really, I met MC Hammer once, tall guy, asshole. But uh, actually, talked to yes. Ronald Reagan in 85. I spent three days live on the air doing, uh, we called it the cause for 85 after the uh, other thing happened. And Ronald Reagan, I would call the White House every week, back in the 81, 82, 83, just ask for Ron, Nancy, whatever. But he called me up and said, well, I I appreciate what you're doing, Lee. Yeah, it's Captain Lee. Captain Lee, come on. No, I was just going to say, well, uh, well, Captain Lee, uh, you. Well, yeah. well I, all I want to do is uh, play music and be a top 40 DJ. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. that's great. <laughs> oh, yeah. Chris, that's too, that's too good, Chris. Um, well, L Lee asked me to, uh, I've related this little story to him and, and he, he, he kind of invited me here to, to, to re repeat it for you. Uh, back in some of my rock and roll engineering days in Memphis, Tennessee, I was with um, uh, Rock 98. We were like the, the second string rock station in town, trying to become number one over uh, Rock 103. And and so we sponsored usually the, kind of the second tier rock concerts in town because the other station got most of the first tier stuff. And the uh, there was a band that had a, a couple of hits on the rock and metal charts, and they were that Christian metal band known as Striper. Now, there was also Petra, you may remember, from back in the late 80s. Um, but but there was a Striper. Now, my program director there, who I, is who I generally kind of answered to, um, he was of the Jewish faith, and he was not real impressed with Striper. So, <laughs> and apparently, the station had agreed to go pick the band up from the Peabody Hotel bring them to the station for an interview, and then take them over to the Mud Island Amphitheater in Memphis on the river uh, for their concert. And so uh, he didn't want to hire a limo for that. He just, he called me over, Kirk, would you come to my office? Yeah, yeah. He says, he says Kirk, this, um, and he rolls his eyes as big as you can. He says, this um, Christian metal group called Striper is in town. And you know, we're sponsoring them. We're the, we're the official station. Would you, would you go pick them up at the Peabody Hotel on Sunday late morning and bring them over here for an interview? And then they're going to do a concert uh, like mid afternoon. They got this matinee concert or something like that. I said, and and I knew that my wife at the time just loved Striper. She just loved Striper. I mean, she didn't talk about any musical groups at all except for Striper. So <laughs> I think she thought they were hot. And so as uh, I. I, I, I I told him the music director, oh, you know, that, I said, yeah, that yellow, yeah. Yellow and black, the yellow and black vinyl or whatever leather they used to wear. 
Of course. Why yeah. wouldn't she? <laughs> of course. Yes. The spandex and all that. So and the, the hair, the hair, all the hair. And so uh, I went home and I and I I, I told my, my then wife and I said, uh, we're not going to be able to go to church or we're going to leave early uh, Sunday. And she looks at me like, why? What's, what's the radio station make you do now? <laughs> and I said, well, we have to take the, the car because we had just got this new like um, uh, custom van. It was a Toyota custom van, but it was a custom van. It was kind of it was kind of it was only six months old. It was kind of nice. And I said, well, we have to go to the Peabody Hotel and pick up this group and take them to the radio station. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Can't they mm -hmm. let us have a day off? And I, I said, well, it's it's uh, it's Striper. <laughs> she's like, oh, <laughs> can I go? Yes, of course you can go. <laughs> so and we picked up Striper and, and took him in the back entrance of the radio station because we didn't know if there'd be a, a crowd or a mob because uh, they were popular. And uh, and they did the interview, and then we took him over to Mud Island, and and you know my my then wife was just ah, striper. <laughs> <laughs> That's there awesome. That's awesome. Thanks for listening. And just uh, and also listening. also knowing that you had a shagging wagon is pretty awesome too. <laughs> shagging wagon. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Well, uh, hey, it's time for us to take a quick break. Uh, Lee Melton is our guest. Chris Tarr is along. We have more tomfoolery coming up. I know that Lee, work on a couple more stories for us. We've got, uh, we've got another 15 minutes to go here. Our show this week, and, uh, and Chris, stand by. It's it's your time to shine because we're going to talk about angry audio. And, and Catfish is texting me, uh, Chris, and he's asking if we can talk about uh, the, the Rebel uh, mic processor. Of course, it's up to you what you want to talk about, Chris. You're the spokesperson for angry audio uh, this week. <laughs> So um, what you got? We're going to do what Catfish wants or something else? I'm going to do what Catfish wants. I, I am right now using a Rebel mic processor. Uh, these things are fantastic. And I actually was able to get a, a B-Stock version, so I saved a couple of bucks. But worth every dollar. It is the best mic processor I've ever heard. And it's so simple. I wish I could swing the camera around and show it to you, but uh, it's... Uh, a little hard to do that, but basically, I was because I'm now doing voice tracking things. I needed a mic processor that help that holds up, and I also like to not have to worry about messing with all the settings to make it sound good. This sounded great out of the box. I only had to make a couple of adjustments to do it. You've got every kind of I/O you need in the back of it. Uh, it's got uh, the XLR. It's got the Studio Hub. You can do line level through it, uh, and then on the front. There's the front panel there, and that cover that you see there pops off, and the controls are under it. And I'm telling you right now, the controls, they're so simple. I'm looking at it right now, and you've basically got input-output levels. You've got uh, the, the de-esser. You've got just a very simple EQ control. But one of my favorite controls on this, and you can kind of see it there, it's called room noise or, or room, basically. And it's like a gate, but it's amazing because it doesn't sound like one. In fact, right now, I have it turned all the way up. I have it all the way engaged. And you can't tell that I'm using a, using a gate. But what it does is it's like all of a sudden a lot of because I have a lot of room noise. And you can still hear some of it. But, I mean, it just takes that room noise and shrinks it into nothing. And, in fact, Corny kind of talks about it. it like it almost magically adjusts the size of the room that you're in. It's just an amazing control. And, again, the best part about this is the simplicity. You're not going to, if you put this in a studio, you're not going to have to worry about the settings always changing. You need a little screwdriver to, to make the tweaks. And so once you set it, which by the way, again, only takes a couple of minutes because it is custom designed for the RE series microphone. So it doesn't need all of the adjustments. And that was the conversation that Catfish had with Corny when they designed this. They said, well, you know, why are there so many controls? And, and Corny said, well, if I knew what kind of microphone was going to connect to it, well, that's a different story. So that's what they did. So they've got the Rebel and they've got the Smooth. Rebel is RE for the RE20. Smooth is the SM for the SM57. And they are basically, again, they're so simple, easy to use, and they sound great right out of the box. Even if you don't want to adjust it at all, just taking it out of the box and plugging it in makes you sound great. So check it out. It is the Angry Audio uh, part of their Chameleon line. This is the Rebel mic processor for the RE series from Electro Voice. Call your favorite favorite, and we know who's you know what our favorite is 
for ordering your broadcast gear. Call them today, get a quote, get these in your studio. You're going to love them. I guarantee it. Angry Audios, Audio Chameleon, get angry. <laughs> That's all I can say. I got angry and I'm very happy I did. Just start it. <laughs> I'm happy I got angry. Yes, I'd like to have an argument, please. <laughs> yes. Now I just am angry all the time and I love it. Hey, uh, thanks very much, Chris, and thanks, Angry Audio. Our show also brought to you by Max Connect, and we'll talk for a second about their box, the U.192. This is a USB interface. You're thinking, what? What do I need that for? Well, so many people are trying out, and 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 people are using uh, these FM audio processors that run on a PC. Things like uh, Omnia SST or Stereo Tool or Breakaway One, and these products, um, some people use them with um, uh, some people. What he was get, getting into there, so I can't, uh, you know, I know Max Connect, uh, they're, they've got the Max Connect, the wireless uh, product, which I use. Uh, in fact, I carry them around. I have one that I have in the car all the time and basically gives you connectivity from wherever you're at. I use them for STLs. I use them for emergency backups. I have one, in fact, for telemetry at a transmitter site where I don't have a phone or a network interconnection. So these are great devices. They're basically like a, Sw like a Swiss Army knife for data for your transmitter sites. It is prioritized packet data. Oh, he was talking about U U192 too. And, and uh, what that is, is that's a, an interface where you can use a program like Stereo Tool. One of the things that people had issues with before with, with trying to do a Stereo Tool with RDS and a pilot and all that other stuff is creating the baseband uh, signal. And you really have to have a super high sample rate in order to do that and a special sound card. And for years, there have been forums and things where people have been discussing you know, the best off the shelf card that generally works good. And, you know, what do you have to modify to get it to work? This is just plug and play. You plug it into your USB port and it's got the out composite output. It's got analog outputs and you plug that right into your transmitter and you have got a composite audio directly to where you need to go. And that means you can use software like stereo tool or the Omnia software to do all of your processing on a PC and know that the output is going to work with whatever you plug it into, whether it's the composite, you know, whether it's a uh, composite transmitter or an STL or whatever, uh, and you plug it into your uh, computer, it is just going to work. It's a fantastic product. Try it out. I actually checked it out uh, in Madison. They had one out and they are plug and play easy and a great way to use uh, to use software fairly inexpensively to get yourself a full flood processor with RDS and things like that. Check it out, Max Connect Broadcast. It's actually uh, in partnership with Angry Audio. It's a fantastic device. You're going to love it. Contact your broadcast dealer today for the Max Connect U192 USB sound card interface. Uh, looks like, is Kurt back, uh, Kurt back on? I see that he's logged in. There he is. Hello, sir. Sorry about I that. I'm not sure you. what happened. Oh, there you are. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what happened. I got, I'm all wired in. I was now I'm on the Wi-Fi and I'm working. So I don't know why, I don't okay. know why the wired uh, quit working. We're back. Thank well, you, Chris, I took for care taking of, over the I took care of Max Connect for you. So there you go. Ah, uh, that's awesome. I, I'm see, I tried to tell Lee Melton that you were a good guy and we've just proven it, you know, once again. Why do you lie? Don't lie. No, no, no. He, People know Actually, I'm a good guy. They're going to seek me out. <laughs> You did a great pickup on that, uh, losing the signal. Great pickup. Great. Nice job. <laughs> well, all of a sudden I saw my face there. I'm like, oh, I guess I'm talking now. And then I froze because I, 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 I got to be honest, I wasn't sure what you were talking about with Max Connect because I was looking at something on my phone. So I started talking about the, the Max Connect wireless and went, oh, that's right. I remember you saying U192. So anyway, we got it out there. We talked oh, about two. They got a two for one. There you that's go. That's right. right. That's right. Awesome. Lee, I'm uh, telling you, if, if this right. engineering thing doesn't work out, Chris can certainly go on the air and, and, and do well yeah. with that. I can tell. I can tell. Well, I am Very now. Nice. We, we forgot. Oh, that's to right. I, I'm not on the radio now. Dude, you're making money hand over fist. <laughs> oh, you're adorable. <laughs> you're so talented. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's, uh, called, it's called not being able to say no is really the issue. <laughs> Lee, uh, you've you've talked very um, uh, glowingly about your experience in, in Beaumont, Texas. Is that your favorite place you've ever 
uh, worked in radio or do you have some some place that's really close to your heart other than that? Actually, I love Thousand Oaks, California. I love that town. Played golf with uh, Tim Conway. I love the station it was back in 80, 81, I think. But yeah, Beaumont has been very good to me. And I, I'm making money hand over fist. <laughs> and it's, it, they, they are so loving good radio here, which I love. So what, Thousand Oaks, California, is that where you are now in Thousand Oaks? Oh, no, no, no. Actually, I'm in a little town outside of Beaumont, Texas called Sarah Lake. There's no oh, lake, it's oh, not Sarah. Okay. Yeah, you know what? I know, Thousand Oaks, I love. I love my city, California. Got my start in Christian radio there and then moved to Wasco outside of Bakersfield and kicked ass, okay. kicked names. But yeah, Beaumont's been very, very good to me. Uh, I've owned two stations. I built two stations and worked for every friggin' entity in town, almost. Um, have you had the chance? I'm sorry. Go ahead. We, we, we got some go delay. Ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I did not work Portuguese or country or uh, Catholic radio. But yeah, I've done everything else. Uh, <laughs> um, thinking about advice to other people coming up in the business, you know, it seems like there there's not as many people getting into radio as there were. There's maybe not as many jobs. Certainly people, you know, stations used to have a full bevy, right, of full-time announcers, um, and maybe they did other things around the radio station, but there's just not as many people in the business now. But for people who want to get into content creation and describing and talking on the radio, maybe doing interviews or introducing things and, and you know, what whatever it is in broadcasting behind the microphone, uh, Lee, have you got some advice that you'd like to pass along to, to people uh, considering your many years uh, behind the mic? Okay, uh, okay, kids. Radio is a great opportunity if you don't like making money. It's a a great gig, and I think the DJs have the fragilest egos and the biggest egos in the world. But uh, radio is still the the number one thing in my life. I love radio, but. Uh, with Twitter Channel, Cumulus, and whoever else is out there, you have no chance anymore. Yeah. The, the, there is no shot for guys like me and you coming up in radio. I totally agree. I totally agree. There is no more farm team. I mean, when I started, uh, yeah. I started my, my first job was board hopping a satellite feed at an AM country station in my hometown. And then went on to, you know, play, do weekends at a uh, polka station playing records, um, you know, and then full time in a, in a small town. And, you know, I made, I, th I think I made a whopping $250 a week or something. But, you know, we all got our start at these small stations that needed to fill the seats. And, you know, if you were lucky and you worked hard, you, you know, you looked at the R&R &R opportunities page and, you know, you, you moved up through the ladder, which is, you know, how I did it and how you guys did it. And now there's no such thing. Now, some people are treating, you know, podcasting and, and YouTube is kind of a, a farm team kind of thing. They look for talent there, but you're right. Now, you know, there's a whole other argument about did that have to happen? Um, you know, it, there's some economic things going on there, but you're right. I mean, in terms of of the job, you know, there is no more farm team. It's, it's basically, you know, in, in fact, the, the, I would say the quality of the talent, I don't want to say got worse, but it certainly changed in markets over the years because, you know, a lot of times you're getting people who have very little on air experience coming in and that's all you have anymore to fill these positions in larger markets. It's good, good, good points, Chris. And it, it, one thing that I that I don't mind about other forms of content creation is they can be compatible with also being good on the radio. So if you want to get started, I mean, there's very little risk in getting started on YouTube or or uh, Instagram or other places where you can 
create something and try something. And if you get subscribers, great. If you don't, maybe, maybe you're maybe you're not that good or your topics aren't that good. But if you get good at something and then you and you gain some name for yourself, and then you want to take the talent that, or the confidence that you gain in in talking to people or doing fun things and translate that into being on the radio, do a morning show, be a frequent guest, and, and then move into something more full time. I think that's a possibility to maybe the farm team is other social media that's free or, or you can get started and you can fail and it's okay. I will say Kurt, maybe. that, uh, you know, one of the things that the benefits of voice tracking these days is we are able to get some, uh, some veteran talent on the air because, you know, it's so much easier now to do the job. You're not having to come into a studio you know, for four hours, five days a week. Uh, in fact, I just started doing mornings myself because I get voice track of the night before I could sit here in my, my office and do it. And I never would have taken that if, if I had to actually get up and, and go do it. Um, you know, but we launched this new station and we wanted somebody who, you know, had some experience doing the morning show there. And so that, you know, it it's made sense for me because I look forward to it. But we have a guy on one of our country stations who is worked in all kinds of markets and was a big name here in Milwaukee, got retired out of Clear Channel, and he's doing, uh, he's on the air for us, and he loves the fact that he doesn't have to leave the house, and he sounds great on the air. So, you know, there are some of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, their voice tracking has helped, and then there are some that hurt. You know, as they say with voice tracking, uh, you know, a lot of the good people actually can now make a living <laughs> doing this uh but we have lost some of the spark and magic that was in in local radio years ago so we're uh talking with chris tar and also lee melton on this week in radio tech we're taking a break from the usual tech talk to talk about things we love about radio and chris you mentioned voice tracking and how um you know people who may be, may be retired from the business uh can can still continue to work their trade and make a little money uh, and and for, it just recurred to me at one of our stations here, uh, WDTL, the classic country station. Uh, we actually, for several years, we had Moby in the morning, and Moby was huge in Atlanta. Uh, now he's been, uh, and I, I want to say he may have been in Houston also, but um, uh, we had him on the air. Now, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago. But uh, man, we had him on the air here, and what a talent! I mean, really good morning show here. Well, Lee, do you have you something know, to add we, to that? We, Oh, I'm sorry, Chris, go ahead. I just, before, I, let me just hop in real quick. One of the things that was brought up that made some sense to me, even though I, I really dislike it as an old radio guy, is a show like Seacrest where, you know, it's just kind of, I look at it as kind of wall, vanilla wallpaper, but that audience, that top 40 audience, it's Seacrest, and, and they love listening to him because it's Brian Seacrest and the, the people that he knows and hangs around with they don't care that it doesn't originate from that studio. They just wow. like Ryan Seacrest. Yeah. And I think that's kind of been a little bit of a change too in radio with syndication that, you know, it, it's always been about the content. And unfortunately with, with the standards kind of lowering over the years with some of the people on the air, that's, you know, it's opened the door for the Seacrests of the world uh, to really put out a product that people enjoy like Moby. And we run the Woody show on a couple of our stations. Uh, people love that. So, Bobby Bones is another example. So, you know, as much as I, I've never been a fan of syndication, it, there's a reality there that people don't really care who it is as long as it's as long as they're good. Lee, what do you have to add to that? Well, actually, I hate voice tracking. I thought it was the death of radio until I had to do it. And I like it. It's crazy. I can <laughs> sit at home, play a show. <laughs> I thought well, it would be the death of radio, and I'm right. It has become the death of radio. I mean, when I, when I can hire a guy from New, from New York to be in Beaumont, Texas. No, that's, that is not right. No, I want local talent, live local. I hate, no, a Casey Kasem and the Top 40 thing and all that. I love that kind of thing on Sunday. On Sunday. <laughs> not not my drive time, 6A to 10B. Come on. 
Sure. Well, you know, and I, I get you on that. Now we we do we're almost all voice track, but all of our you know we all hire local people that voice track because all of our stations are regional, so we're all in Wisconsin. So all of our voice tracking people are Wisconsin, and they do you know a couple of our stations north and south or whatever. And, but we're all from the area, so we we know it well. But I think that there are you know again. You know, one of the things we talk about with voice tracking is, you know, if, if you screw something up really badly, you can always do it over. Um, we do a lot of just in time voice tracking where we voice track, you know, 10, 15 minutes before the track goes on the air. And we like to be able to do that. I think it, it gives some flexibility to the people on the air. We've actually saved some money on real estate because we don't have to have 10 studios for 10 stations or, you know, that sort of thing. So, there's been some upside and I think it was inevitable, but you're right. It has lost some of the magic. And if I had unlimited funds and could support it, I certainly would love to have people in the seats all day. I'm going to take a wild guess and say that, that uh, Lee is not in favor of AI voice tracking. That's done by uh, I don't think anybody is robot. that yet. <laughs> AI can go hey. to hell. Come on. Come on. Guys. Come on. <laughs> Hey, we, hey, we've got a. If they can, uh, do, we got, if they can do one, my monster truck commercial like I do, it's coming to Beaumont. It's grave digger. Blow me. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have one more, one more quick break to do here, and and, and then we're going to come back with a final word from Chris Tarr and from Lee Melton. And I just, I love the excitement and the the passion of of this show. Uh, we, you, you know, engineers get passionate about things, but man. People who are on air, we we have opinions, and I'm glad to hear them. Hey, this week in Radio Tech is brought to you in part by Broadcasters General Store, and one of the lines that they represent is Vox Pro. Vox Pro has been a favorite of uh, DJs, on air people, talk show hosts, uh, doing all kinds of different jobs. We think of it as something to record phone callers, and it certainly is, but it can record other things too, long form programs. It can delay things. Uh, it can help you. It can help you do just in time voice tracking. So let's check it out. Vox Pro. We'll be right back. Hey, what's happening? St. John here coming to you from Command Central and wanted to tell you about the absolute best partner you can have in radio. I'm talking about, boom, Wheatstone's Vox Pro. Now, a lot of folks have used uh, previous versions of Vox Pro. All awesome, but I want to tell you about some of my favorite new features in 7. And for folks who've never used Vox Pro before, I'm about to tell you why it's an absolute game changer and essential for really fast-paced multi-element radio. Lots of different audio software out there. Why Vox Pro? Uh, cause duh, it was designed for radio. It's the only software designed to do what we needed to do, which is record, edit, playback in real time. When I say lightning fast, I'm going to show you how fast you can edit stuff up in Vox Pro right now. So literally three clicks on the controller, mark left, mark right, everything that gets marked, you hit delete, it goes away. It's literally that fast. So we're going to take this part right here. Boy, help. Nine, I think. Boom. From caller nine to him saying, I'm ready. Five. I'm ready for that secret sound. Boom. All of that stuff, hit delete, it goes away. Here's your edit. Two are tackling secret sound, caller nine. I'm ready, St. John. So one of the best features of version 7, this is awesome, it's effects macros and you can literally put a chain of effects together so that instead of uh, having to normalize a phone bit and then uh, use noise reduction on it and EQ it and all that, you can literally build a chain. One button, this button, this one's called call right here, I just click that, all of those processes happen instantaneously. Literally saves 80% of your editing and cleanup time. Final thing that I love about Vox Pro, and there's so much more to get into, but uh, one of my favorite things, you can load it on a laptop. I've literally done my show from a hotel room in Armenia to uh, the conference room at, yeah, this was fun, jury duty. Great thing, no one could tell the difference. Vox Pro makes it totally easy. I'm telling you, if you're looking for the best on-air partner, call my friends at Wheatstone, ask them about Vox Pro, and you'll be glad you did. Actually, call your friends at Broadcaster's General Store because they'll give you a discount. When you call them about Vox Pro, uh, the website bgs.cc, the phone number 352 622 7700. BGS stands for Broadcasters General Store. I've been buying from them since the late 1980s, uh, sitting in Sam Phillips' office in Memphis, Tennessee. He said, Call them pretty girls over at Vox at, uh, at BGS and let's get a good price. So uh, <laughs> they're good folks. Thanks a lot, BGS, for sponsoring this week in Radio Tech. Chris Tarr is here, and Lee Melton is here as well. Uh, it's time for a quick tip of the week before we uh, have to go. 
And I'm going to hit Chris up first. Uh, and and uh, Lee, you'd be thinking of a tip you'd like to leave our listeners with. But Chris, take it away. You got a tip for us? All right. Well, I'll do a, I'll do an engineering tip, even though we've been talking about being on the air, uh, which I've been now for two weeks, been having fun. Classic country, 106.5. Uh, so anyway, my, my tip this week is, as we mentioned at the top of the show, I put in a new Valcom antenna on my AM station uh, a little farther north here in Wisconsin. And it's about keeping an open mind to this new stuff. Now, you know, Valcom is kind of a, an interesting new design for AM antennas. Um, you know, there's no free lunch. There are some trade-offs with it. But, you know, when the tower fell, my first thought was, well, I'm going to get another tower put up and we'll just do the traditional AM thing. And I talked to another engineer who said, hey, you know, you should check out Valcom. They're, you know, fairly inexpensive, easy to put up. And at your frequency for a single tower, uh, you know, it's it's really super, it's a no-brainer. And I, I kind of was hesitant because, you know, you look at that and you go, well, how is that, you know, how well could it possibly work? And da, 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 da. Well, I'm here to tell you it worked perfectly. I mean, it took two days to install, uh, get it on the air. The coverage is almost identical to what it was with the original steel tower. And uh, again, the, the people at Valcom are just super, super cool to work with. So, um, you know, if I not if if I had been set in my ways of the this is how we've always done it, I wouldn't have done that. And I think I would have missed out because this was, I think, the best decision we made uh, in this particular situation was going with that particular antenna. I'd like to get a full report on that microphone. from you there on, a, on, a, on a future uh, a future show. Uh, I just yeah, I'd love to talk it, more it about it. It's fun. Yeah. Oh, yeah. is that a it, picture? It, it looks, yeah. It, now, it, does it work on CB Channel 19 or is it, is it for AM? <laughs> well, mine is all white. I didn't paint mine. But, uh, ah, yeah, it's okay. it's a really interesting design. It really is. Nice. Nice. I want to hear more about that. Yeah. We engineers wonder, does, it, does that thing really work? It's not very big, you know. So we got to compare I mean, it's, the, it's the Heba super, antenna it, and the Valcom. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not super efficient. And I actually had to reduce power a bit at night because of SkyWave. Uh, because it is the top loaded, short top loaded antenna. But, you know, again, when you're looking at, you know, nowadays with AM towers and, and finding people who can maintain them and getting permits to put things up, I mean, this just, this was a home run. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you. All right. Lee Melton has been our guest. Lee, we're looking for a tip of the week. What wisdom would you like to leave all those, uh, all those engineers and want to be on the air people like me? Uh, never do an overhead ground system. We tried that. It took us three years to realize it wasn't going to work. Very in the ground, copper. But yeah, the overhead ground system, I put up 78 or 81 uh, telephone poles. We ran copper up on the sky. It didn't work. And oh Dave Beyonde, who you know. No, no, and Dave Beyonde tried this new ground system. Overhead, it didn't work. So, stay with what you know. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you mentioned Dave Biondi, a friend of yours and engineer for you, and and uh, I, I met Dave Biondi s several times. Good fellow. No, I love Dave to death. In fact, he's now doing Spanish, I think, out yeah. of uh, Houston. I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I know, friend. I know two Spanish words. I know, I know Spanish words. Enchilada. And taco. That's it. That's <laughs> a lot of time. Well, <laughs> I'm married to a Spanish speaking person, and uh, so I, I've had to learn some Spanish. And I've, oh, I have. And you, I've you, also. And you, and you have to be nice, too, because they have a temper from hell. <laughs> oh, she's only gotten mad at me a couple times when, when I mispronounced something or accidentally. I think I, one day I was trying to learn my Spanish, and I accidentally called her a swamp donkey. That didn't go over very well. Really? I'm really <laughs> that's crazy. Come on, and have a sense of humor. Uh, hey, we we've got to go. I've had uh, smiled and laughed so much during this show. Leith Melton, thank you for being with us. I, I appreciate hearing about some of your adventures and your early start in radio at KFI and how it all went downhill from there. So, <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> I'm loving your Good. life. Thank you. Chris Tarr, I have missed you. I'm glad you're back to uh, be with us uh, this week. By the way, Chris Tarr, if you can be with us next week, uh, we're doing the show from the new WSM studios in Nashville. Oh, man, is Jason going to be on? 
Yeah, yeah, Jason could. Yeah, he's oh, going to be my guest. I mean, I, I met Jason. He took me on a tour down there last year when I was in, he, in Tennessee. So, people. yeah, I'll try to get he's in the there back. to say hi to him. Yeah. Okay, good deal. Good deal. Thanks a lot. And uh, thanks especially to our uh, show producer, and that is Suncast. Does a great job of handling even last-minute difficulties. Really appreciate you, Suncast. Thanks very kindly. Lee Melton has been our guest and Chris Tarr, co-host. And we got to go. We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech.